the final countdown. Mm-hmm. And now we are live, and uh, welcome uh, to the uh, commissioner's uh, luncheon with the electeds. Uh, it is April 15th. <clears throat> Typically it would have been tax day, but no it's not. And I'm John Hutchings, the chair of the board, and this is... Prime Minister. Uh, Romero Chavez. I don't know if everybody on the screen, if you're the same in the same order that I'm seeing, I can't, I don't know if you are or not. Uh, but let's start with the courts. Will the court introduce themselves? <laughs> one by, how do you do that? The public is all, have the same screen as you see oh, it right now. Oh, the public sees it, okay. Yeah. And the names show up then? Yep. Good. You've all been checked in, uh, and we see everybody except uh, the sheriff and the coroner, but we know you're there. Thank you. So, uh, well, I'll we start because I think I'm first on the screen. This is Judge Mary Sue Wilson calling in from Family and Juvenile Court. Hello. Hello. Hi, Mary. Thank you for joining us. Oh, this, this is Eric Price uh, calling uh, from uh, Superior Court here. I, I hope you can hear me. Huh? <clears throat> Yes, we can. Judge Schaller, Judge Schaller, your your audio is a little bit off. Hello? It's very muffled. We can barely hear you. I can barely hear you guys too. I don't know what's going on. Just like the volume is way down. I have it all the way up. I'm not sure. Okay. I'm here to listen. Linda, introduce yourself. <laughs> Or just get closer to the camera. Jeffrey. No, we can't hear you, Linda. We cannot hear you. I can hear you now. Okay, good. <laughs> Treasurer, go ahead. To sign on. We send that information early in the week. Okay. I think I need to do that to be able to share my screen. Treasurer's working on it. I'm not sure who's next, but this is Mary Hall, Thurston County Auditor. How about before you? No, you're next. You got it, Mary. Thank you. you. John Tunheim, go ahead. Hello, everyone. John Tunheim, Prosecuting Attorney. All right. Jeff, did you figure it out? Jeff Gadman? Yeah. This has been really interesting having to be my own tech wizard. Yeah. Judge Sam, will you introduce yourself, please? Uh, uh, Sam Meyer, Thurston County District Court. Thank you, Coroner. Uh, Gary here. And the sheriff we know is here. Thank right. you. We do have an agenda. And uh, Commissioner Edwards uh, came in also, so he's here. And if any of you are in within walking distance and you're hungry, we have a box lunch here for you as well from Panera. Just come on over. And we have an agenda. And what is the I don't have the agenda. Thank you. Oh, okay. It was on, on, on the other packet. Okay. COVID-19, if you haven't heard of that, COVID-19 <laughs> office, <laughs> office reports, and the next is going to be the budget impacts. Uh, so let's start with just the office reports. I'm going to uh, start with Judge Price, the uh, presiding judge. That's better. All right. Am I unmuted now? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so uh, first of all, thanks uh, for the opportunity to, to talk here at the uh, this uh, elected uh, meeting. We, we, of course, at the Superior Court are, are looking very uh, interestedly uh, at the, uh, the different uh, information coming out. We had a, an order from our Supreme Court that was issued Monday night um, that changed uh, the court's view on when we would look at a some sort of a slow open or an open uh, for the courts uh, to uh, to May 4. It was previously in in uh, the end of April, and now it's May 4. Uh, as the as the board uh, knows, we've uh, independently uh, uh, made it have an emergency order that discusses reopening in some fashion. Um, well, reopening more, I should say, on April or check that May 18. We're still not doing any trials. We're not uh, doing any out of custody criminal work. We are doing. Uh, in custody, uh, criminal work, but no trials. We're still processing the new arrest that happened. 
Um, and we are currently planning, uh, spending a lot of time planning uh, what it looks like when we do open, what it looks like, how do we go about our, uh, our functions when, if we have to continue to socially distance, if we, and when we start doing jury trials, what that looks like, how many we can do practically. Uh, we've been talking with both the prosecutor and public defense uh, about their thoughts on that. Um, and, uh, and it's just a real challenge. I mean, it's the challenge uh, all the agencies are facing, but uh, we're going to have a real backlog that we're going to have to deal with, uh, huge volumes uh, that we're going to have to deal with. And, uh, and how we go about doing that is currently what we're talking about. We're trying to try not to get surprised if the line moves, if the line stays at May 4, or if it, uh, if it moves out a little bit, we'll We'll see where we are, but that's our that's our current challenge right now is do, doing all this planning. Okay. Anybody else from the court want to weigh in? Whoever speaks first has it. Go ahead, Linda. Well, I'll just speak to what I'm doing with my staff. Obviously, I my staff's working, coming in. The essential staff are coming in to work to cover the hearings. So in the family court office, I have four staff, two that deal with the domestic violence victims and the other two for the court hearings. Um, at the main office, there's anywhere from, I believe, two to three, in addition to Tawny. And um, the rest of my staff is working from home, uh, putting in eight-hour days and doing a lot of projects and processing all the paperwork. Yeah. This is Mary Sue Wilson from Family Court, and I'll just remind folks what we're doing on our reduced operations, and Linda's team's a great help. We are doing emergency-only proceedings. We're open in the afternoon. Nearly everything is by phone or video. Mm -hmm. So we have an involuntary treatment act video hearings, and then we have phone hearings for family law emergencies and the protection orders that Linda referenced, as well as shelter care hearings, so kids that have been removed from their parents. We have 72-hour removal hearings, review the circumstances of removal. Those are by phone as well. Um, and then we are uh, re uh, having hearings for juveniles, only juveniles that are in detention. So we do those every day at 1.30, and they're either uh, kids that have been arrested or picked up on a warrant, or kids that have a case pending and their release conditions have them held in detention on high bail, so they're in detention. I think as of today, right now, we have 12 youth in detention, and we're closely monitoring that. So we're doing you know, the much less than we do in normal times um, in the courtroom and nearly everything by phone um, or video. Like Judge Price said, we're planning for when things open up a little bit, probably employing similar techniques of, of phone call participation to minimize numbers of people coming to the courtroom and other strategies like reducing the size of calendar so we don't have a lot of people at the courthouse. Um, it, we do have a couple of processes we put in place over the last week for agreed order. So people don't have to have a hearing, but they can just submit electronically agreed final papers like the final divorce and uh, documents to get probates going without coming to court. So we're happy about that because we're hopeful that things ready to resolve can be addressed off the record or without a hearing and relieve some of the pressure we know we'll experience when we open back up. Okay, thank you. Uh, Chris, you want to go next? Yeah, you're muted, ma'am. She didn't have anything to watch, she said. Oh, okay. Romero can read lips, I can. <laughs> Judge Meyer. Yeah, hi. Um, yeah, thanks for having this meeting here. Just a, a lot of what's going on in Superior Courts, what's happening in District Court as well. You know, we're assembling quite a bow wave of cases. As you know, District Courts are pretty high volume. And so we're all kind of nervous about what's going to happen when, as this thing scales back down. Um, I don't think there's, I don't think anyone thinks there's going to be a slow end. <clears throat> um, jury trials are going to remain an issue that we 
again, at this time, yeah, we talk about it, but I'm not sure we have a plan in place how to do that. Um, I do want to talk about how cooperative the prosecutor and the defense prosecutor's office and the Office of Public Defense have been working together to, you know, get through all this. Um, also, right now, um, for the past couple of weeks, we've only been doing in-custody hearings. They've all been done remotely. Attorneys have phoned in with the uh, defendants on the screen. Just this week, we're transitioning to start out of custody remote hearings, um, and then we're using Zoom, and then those are also being streamed on YouTube uh, to provide public access. And so we've been starting that this week. Um, it should be going on a while ago. It was going on this morning. And um, it, we're going to try and do that more um, as this goes on. One of the bigger issues that we've had in district court, and I know in limited jurisdiction courts throughout the state, probably superior court too, is anti-harassment orders. You know, there's certain time frames when anti-harassment orders need anti-harassment orders need to be heard. We've had to essentially waive that and set those out further. We're going to be looking at, and again, it kind of remains unknown as to when the uh, a temporary gets entered, and then they have a hearing to determine whether or not a final would be entered. Um, we're going to start looking at doing those remotely through Zoom and then streamed on YouTube to provide public access also, but that's, that's ongoing. But other than that, we're kind of all in the same boat here. I think there's a lot of unknowns that we're all dealing with and I'm you know, not really sure how this is all going to turn out. I'm not sure any of us are. Yeah, well, we are all in the same boat, that's for sure. Uh, how about uh, Jeff Gadman, treasurer? Hey, how are you? Fine, thank you. <clears throat> so, I... I continue to have staff, all my staff working. Um, almost everybody can work remotely. Uh, there's a couple of things that we have to do in the office. So on any given day, I've got from two to five people in here out of a staff of 12 plus myself um, processing uh, checks that we've received in the mail is one of the things that we have to do here uh, because for security reasons uh, processing the payments has to be done on a computer that has access to the bank and that's it it's not on the network so um, keep the money coming in and then, so we're doing that the um, <clears throat> right now you, you all know that I uh, extended the deadline to June 1st for payments, except for those payments that are coming through the mortgage companies. As of right now, payments are tracking about where they have historically. Because one of the things I did in my press release is ask people to, if you can pay, to please pay. And so that's encouraging. I, I, don't, I don't have any kind of uh, overly optimistic thought that Why everybody's going to do by you? April 30th, yourself? but as of right now, we're tracking about where we normally would in the middle of April. So that's good. The money's coming in. It should all be in by the end of May. And um, I've got, like I said, staff working from home. Uh, they seem to enjoy it for the most part, although... Uh, they do say that it takes them longer to do their job at home just because they don't have the same team. Yeah. But we're all getting on. Fun times. Uh, John Tunheim. A lot of what I would say is going to sound repetitory. We've got uh, virtually all of our staff working at home now except for uh, core skeleton group that uh, needs to be in the office to handle court hearings that are going on or employ a specific hearing that they have to handle, they, they come in, but otherwise everybody's at home. And I think we're kind of settled in now to a, a, um, a you know, a, a groove, if you will, um, but we're starting to think about what it means as things start to open up again. And so we've started that internal planning process along with uh, opening uh, early discussions with the court and the public defender's office about uh, once we start and, uh, trying to get back to our capacity, what does that look like and what are our priorities and things like that. Uh, so we're, we're now looking down the road a month or two to see what the future is. Try to, try to see what the future might be. All right. 
How about the uh, here? Yes, um, for right now, we have about 200 and just under 240 inmates in our facility. So we're seeing that uh, OAC and the prosecutor's office and the judges have uh, really been uh, working really dil diligently. And what we're seeing uh, come through our, our jail, um, we're obviously we're doing uh, Class A and B felonies. Um, a person on person assault. We're doing domestic violence and we're doing a DUI's second offense within five years and everything else we're doing the referrals on. Um, also for the patrol side, we're seeing that, um, we're doing a lot more referrals and I know, uh, John Phenheim's office has probably been seeing a lot of those. Uh, right now the jail has been working on how we're confirming warrants and what that's going to look like after May 4th, if it's going to turn and how we're going to do that and how we're going to work with other uh, correction facilities and uh, getting uh, confirming our warrants, like, if you will, people who are over in Spokane and are we going to go get them or not? How are we going to work uh, if the chain gang? Uh, so they're working on that with uh, WASPIC and um, the other sheriff's offices on how we're going to be able to transition back to whatever normal is. Um, I know that uh, as far as crime is, we're seeing uh, more um, violent crime, um, the robbery type stuff going on. And uh, obviously we're seeing a little increase in uh, domestic violence. And so our big fear is, is that what that's going to look like through the end of this month, uh, just because of people having to stay inside and uh, the social distancing stuff like that, so we're just really trying to pay attention to that. Well, you and I talked. You and I talked some time ago about uh, with this uh, this epidemic or pandemic, rather, that res burger go down, commercial burger go up, TV will go up, child abuse would increase. Um, and, uh, and I, mean, I don't know if that's true or not regarding the, the child abuse is on the increase as well. Uh, we are seeing more, not just child abuse, but uh, more sex offense complaints. More what? Sex I, I've got a question for the sheriff. Is yes, sir. The, the increase in the violent crimes you said, is that chance meetings or are these groups of people that are getting together intentionally and something happens uh we're seeing groups of people intentionally getting together i have a question for the sheriff also <laughs> go ahead sheriff it's judge mary sue wilson um yes, are you and the other local chief uh, approaching contact with youth and adults differently in terms of the assessment of whether to detain so that lower level uh, issues are not brought into our system? What we're doing is that we're working together and we're trying to, when we make contacts, whether or not they need to, whether we're going to make a physical custodial arrest or not, yes, we are talking about that and trying to uh, alleviate or, or try to, if you will, uh, resolve the issues before they end up going to juvenile or um, whether they get arrested or referred. So we are working together on that. It just seems to be, um, uh, we're just seeing a little increase in the juvenile uh, issues. And you've already seen uh, at least two juveniles go to your facility for robbery. So um, yes, and Sheriff, I'm not suggesting that law enforcement's been bringing the wrong people in. We have two categories of young people in the detention facility. One is the serious Class A's that you've referenced, and then another category are uh, young people who are putting themselves at risk, and they're sort of chronically coming into the facility because of choices that they're making. So I was just curious how it sounds like you're approaching it the way I had heard anecdotally. Yes, uh, we're trying to, in all sincerity, we are trying to make the least impact 
on the courts and on the prosecutor on OAC during this crisis and just trying to maybe take a different look at how we're approaching these, um, the people that we do contact with and is there a way that we can resolve the issue instead of, like you said, instead of incarceration and uh, we are working on that together and we all are talking about it. So, yeah. Hey, Sheriff, um, in light of the, the pandemic, do we have people So if I could add a couple things real quick. What? Who's talking? Uh, the sheriff. Oh, I have a question for you. Okay, go for your question. Um, in light of the pandemic and a good judgment and alcohol don't go in hand in hand, do you have people that your sheriff deputies on the road are coming into contact with and or even corrections that are taking advantage uh, of the situation and coughing, sneezing, spitting on uh, uh, your staff? No, we're not. We're not seeing that. I think if you will say the taking advantage of is, and like all of you could probably agree, we are seeing people uh, drive more excessively. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, obviously we're trying to be out there and be seen and try to limit our contacts as appropriately needed. And uh, that, that's what we're seeing mostly of. But as far as the spitting and stuff like that, we're not seeing that. Oh, that's good. Okay, go ahead, sir. Who, who's next? John, you had more to say? I do. Um, just to let you know that uh, there are going to be conversations because uh, Evergreen State College is looking at making some changes. And uh, I don't know how drastic those changes are, but... Uh, I really hope that they don't really impact the sheriff's office like I think they're going to. And that's a, that's a big fear of mine right now. Uh, what kind of changes? Uh, I think um, the uh, maybe a reduction in uh, services for law enforcement oh. that they provide. Wow. Okay. Jeepers. Mr. Chair. Oh, yes. <laughs> This is Steve Drew. Just want you to know that I'm uh, attending by phone. Oh, Go, hang on. I was going to ask who is the 4756 is. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, hang on, uh, Stephen. Uh, Coroner, okay. you're next. Yes, good afternoon. Uh, so what I've done here is out of my staff of six investigators, I keep two on a rotation basis here uh, during the day, and then there's one person on call at night. And then they'll turn over to the next person, and then whoever was on call the night before, they they're my uh, my backup person if I need them. Uh, I come in every day to help with phones and uh, uh, manage body count throughout the county uh, for the hospitals and funeral homes. Uh, other than that, um, uh, we've been kind of slow, but lately we had uh, three suicides last week in a two-day period. And then we had four for the week. Uh, two of those cases left notes behind indicating that they believe they had COVID. And, uh, and then we had a home death yesterday that we suspect is COVID. And so we did a swab on that uh, person uh, yesterday and that sample was sent to Shoreline this morning. My biggest fear is, is that uh, everybody is cooped up and uh, when they get people released and out and about, uh, we've got a, uh, a large elderly community population out there that I'm afraid that aren't being checked on. And we're going to be we're going to be finding these people who have been home probably weeks and months and no one's known about it. Mm. Uh, very, very true. Yeah. Without divulging anything, the uh, four suicides. Uh, especially with the uh, the two that left notes, were they elderly or middle aged or young? Uh, uh, one was uh, sixty, and the other was uh, late twenties, early thirties. Good grief! All right, and your staff doing okay? Yeah, yeah, we're doing okay. It's just hard to work from home because we don't have uh, our case files at our fingertips, so uh, it makes a. Uh, uh, completing cases is just a little bit more difficult. Agreed. I'm going to move to Stephen Drew, and uh, you chimed in late, Stephen, so I want you to be aware that we're uh, live streaming as well. 
and then we go to Mary. Oh. And oh. Oh. we already did. We're down to okay. Week. So go ahead, uh, Stephen. <clears throat> All right. Well, the uh, assessor's office obviously is closed. The um, uh, we're working on modifications to the lobby, which, uh, when we reopen, should enable us to serve uh, the public at the counter without endangering our employees. Um, you know, the the statutory calendar for assessment uh, is not. Uh, one that, a thing that's flexible, and we're not being provided relief by this from the state. So we're doing everything we can to uh, respect and stay on schedule, uh, so as to not uh, impact all of the taxing districts' budgetary processes, and so as to collect as much new construction as possible, and so as to ensure that we are able to deliver values that uh, we are confident of. And to do that, we find that we need more time. So we, instead of sending out reval notices June 1st, which we've been on time since I've been in office, we're going to send them out June 15th. That gives us uh, another two weeks, which we much need. Uh, efficiency is a challenge with uh, so many employees at home, and uh, uh, the field crew um, partially not participating um, due to health concerns. Um, and then that causes us to delay the date that we certify to the Board of Equalization uh, to August 24th. Um, I believe with this schedule, we will be pretty successful in capturing all of the new construction. Although I think that there will be a significant impact, adverse impact on the value of new construction that's booked this year, simply because the industry has been shut down in the heart of the construction cycle. Yeah. Um, so we have 32 employees. Uh, uh, we have uh, a management staff that rotates in. Uh, we have enough people in, two to three, from property administration to handle all of the incoming mail and phone calls and uh, to disperse that out to the team that work, is working at home. My field team, we are working two shifts, uh, that is alternating days. So the field appraisal team spends a day in the field and then a day uh, at home, uh, working on cleanup reports. Uh, through that system, we have completed all of our inspections for the cycle, um, and uh, we're in pretty good shape. Uh, it's a pretty immense challenge to keep all of the moving parts um, in sync with one another without the ability to check in with everybody the way you can when everyone's in the office, but. You know, um, everybody's stepping up in good cheer, and I think that's pretty much what I have to say, except stay healthy, everyone. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, good cheer. Auditor Mary Hall. You're up. Can you say that again? I have you. <clears throat> Can you introduce her again? Yeah, Auditor Mary Hall, you're on. <laughs> Okay, sure. Um, so I'm grateful we have done as much coop planning and practice as we've done. 100% uh, of my staff is working remotely. It was actually a pretty seamless transition. Um, my recording department is doing all of um, our recording real estate transactions electronically. So all of the title companies have transitioned to electronic recording. So that's pretty seamless and doing well. We do have a few staff in the office every day for things that are dropped in the Dropbox that can't be done electronically. But, but for the most part, everything is being done electronically and revenue is actually ahead of last year. So I'm pleased to announce that. My licensing department, we are also processing transactions they're either coming in the mail or online through Department of Licensing. 
So that is still, we're continuing operations there. And again, revenue is up in our licensing department as well. We're having regular communication with our uh, title companies and sub-agents. In fact, we have a meeting with our title companies tomorrow that's actually a regularly scheduled meeting that we hope to be doing via Teams. So that communication has been uh, going very well, as well as with our sub-agents. Most of them are still open or open by appointment. So that's very positive. Um, my financial services folks are just doing an amazing job supporting the county through this. Um, we're still working on our CAFR financial, um, financial report. We will be doing our state auditor audit um, for the most part remotely. Uh, fortunately, most of what we do, we have electronic anyway, so we'll just be transferring documents back and forth, giving them read-only access to the files they need access to. And we're supporting emergency um, services, ensuring that we are collecting the proper documentation to ensure that we can recoup the grant funding that is going to be allocated for this event. So I'm really proud of these folks and the teams we've put together and our grants manager, internal auditor, really have a good handle on all of this. So hopefully we learned a lot from the two times we had the OSO uh, landside folks in to, to share their experience. And hopefully that will um, benefit us during this event and um, we'll be able to recoup the dollars that we're allowed. My elections division is also working remotely. Um, this is probably the most challenging department I have right now in preparation for the presidential election and really not knowing what we're going to be faced at that time. But they're currently all working remotely, serving our customers, answering the phones, returning phone calls, processing voter registrations. I, I do have a couple people that come into the office uh, occasionally to scan voter registrations collect the mail um, in our ballot processing center, still tying up loose ends from the presidential primary. We were recently uh, notified that from the CARES grant, we, were, we have been allocated $329,000 to um, prepare for the two federal elections in front of us, which are both our primary and general elections. We're having to get real creative again, because we don't know what that is going to look like. Yeah. So we're brainstorming right now and working with our grants manager to determine what will be el eligible costs, but we have some challenges. How will we have a voting center and have people in there, keep our social distancing, keep, keep people safe? And we also have same day voter registration in a presidential election, which is a first for us. So we're actually toying with the idea of a mobile vote mobile where people actually would not have to get out of their car, that um, they could actually do a drive through. And if they even needed a replacement ballot, we would find out what they needed up front, be able to process that. And by the time they got to the end of the line, we would have that ready for them. So we're just throwing a lot of ideas out, trying to determine what we're going to be looking at in the general election and how we can maximize this $329,000 that the federal government has given to us. Um, in addition to that, we also have about that same amount that was allocated to us from a security grant. And we're moving forward with that and have a lot of ideas for that. However, that's been a little more challenging because we need things like load testing and some things to happen, which we are having a difficulty finding those resources to perform some of the functions that we need to get some of these things in place prior to the general election. So, um, Judge Price, I know I'm going to be talking to you next week. Um, we have some things to discuss because we may be having to share things with what the courts are doing and room 152 or possibly that back parking lot and um, mobile registration. So we're still just trying to figure out, you know, we don't have a crystal ball of what that is going to look like. <clears throat> so I will certainly keep you posted, but we're trying to um, 
save as much of our budget as possible. I heard you the first time when you were talking about counties really need to cut back. So I have allocated a lot of my recording folks to work on our historic document project, which is, so I am now paying them out of a restricted fund 1050 instead of the general fund. So I believe the last check, we've already saved about $6,000 in wages that would normally come out of the general fund that is now being allocated as an allowable cost out of our restricted fund. And this is about a 10 year project that we have in front of us and anything I can do to um, move forward on that project not have to lay off staff, but continue to save general fund dollars. We're going to continue to do that. And I'm also hoping that there will be some things that we had on the horizon that we now will be allowed to use out of this um, CARES money for things like voter outreach in this in this environment that we're in. God, well, I tell you, each of you electeds in your own office are doing amazing work in this unprecedented time with the restrictions uh, and the cards you've been dealt with. I'm gonna turn it over now for the second half of this meeting to uh, Romero. Yeah, before we get, um, thank you, Commissioners, before we get into the second item, which Robin is gonna walk you through, um, some of the presentations that commissioner, or commissioners already received related to the budget and the impacts that this emergency has or will have on our budget and some of the strategies uh, available as to how we can start uh, thinking about this and mitigating some of the impacts because impacts are going to be coming uh, no matter what. So, but I'd like to give you all uh, elected officials a heads up. Uh, I'm going to be sending an email uh, tomorrow and this is a follow-up to my email of April 3rd related to the state at home order and how we're going to be managing the leave for employees. On the last email that I sent, uh, which uh, it will take us all the way through April 20, will be for those uh, uh, staff that are required to come to work to provide essential services. We'll continue to pay as, as we have been. Also, I'd really appreciate every single elected office as well as the departments that have allowed to uh, telecommute for those individuals, those employees who can perform their work remotely. And for those individuals that, um, that have not been able to come to work and, um, and they are not able to telecommute, the way we have it right now until uh, next Monday, they will be adding in their timesheet uh, code related to the emergency sick leave with the hope that we can get reimbursed to that. So there is a limit related to that, um, is a maximum of uh, 10 days and 80 hours. So the question is gonna be how we're gonna be managing from April uh, 21st to May 4th. The way my email will be going out will be business as usual and we'll continue to have those employees who cannot um, come to work or cannot telecommute uh, be put in paid administrative leave. We keep tra we're keeping track as to how much money we're spending every pay period uh, on administrative leave and the, and the dollars keep adding. So through May 4th, uh, for the most part, is going to be business as usual. However, in my email, I'm going to be providing two different scenarios beyond May 4th. And the first scenario will be if the governor uh, stayed at home order does not go beyond May 4th, then uh, at that point, all county employees will be required to report to work on May 5th. Uh, within that context, we continue to encourage every office and department to allow telecommuting options for those employees who can perform their work at remotely. Also within, uh, within the option number one, we'll be providing, uh, it will be asking for every office and department to accommodate uh, social distancing. And for uh, <clears throat> those areas that we cannot provide social distancing in the work uh, environment, then we'll be uh, recommending to wear cloth maskings. And we're in the process to uh, secure uh, a, a number of cloth maskings that will be making available to the EOC. And you saw an email uh, last week related to that, and it will be 
made available on the first conference start basis. My hope is that we will have enough uh, supply to accommodate the needs of employees who may need a cloth mask. Also, uh, we will be, as uh, 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 Stephen Drew has stated, we're exercising and putting uh, some plexiglass shields for in those areas the employees have uh, customer service interactions with the public, and my hope that those will be completed uh, before May 5th. Also, we're gonna be purchasing uh, plastic gloves, rubber gloves, that we will make those available to all those employees who have um, uh, interactions with the public on a customer service. So that is scenario one. Under that scenario also, in, in, in follow up to the order of the governor to protecting those employees at a high risk, um, I will encourage each office and department to accommodate those individuals to work from home via telecommuting. If, uh, if that is not a possibility, those individuals will have to start using the, their personal leave, whether it's vacation or sick leave. If those individuals don't have any leave bank or they run out while they uh, uh, staying at home without having the opportunity to telecommute, then they will be paid on a, a leave without pay status. And that is a key element of that because the, uh, the order of the governor states that we need to accommodate those individuals at a high risk and we need to make sure that we pay their benefits and their uh, uh, jobs will be ready and waiting for them when they have to come back to work. So that is scenario number one. Assuming the, the governor's uh, stay-at-home order does not go beyond May 5th, May 4th. Scenario number two, uh, if the governor extends the stay-at-home order, paid administrative leave will no longer be an option. So we go through the process of those individuals who are required to report to work to perform essential services, business as usual. But for those individuals who continue to telecommute, business as usual. For those employees who cannot come to work and cannot telework, they will be required to use their personal leave. That will be vacation or sick leave. If those individuals run out of uh, uh, their personal leave, they will be putting on a furlough status. And that is the scenario number two. And I just want to give you a heads up as to the email that I'm going to be sending, uh, hopefully tomorrow, after I get all the um, language in place. Anything to add? Anything, Gary? No, sir. <laughs> Any questions? Everybody can uh, raise your hand except Stephen. Go ahead, Stephen. A, clar a clarification, then. Um, in scenario two, would... Uh, cover a period May 5 and onward? That is correct, for as long as the, the governor extends uh, the state of home order. Thank you. Any other questions? Wow. Robin's up. Robin's so up. Robin's up now. Hey, hey. Whoa. Oh, you mute. Mute. There we go. There we go. All, right. All, right. All right. No, we're not all right. It's still not okay. Uh, yeah. So let's see if this works. Can I people hear me? I don't know. Give where a thumbs up. Can you hear Robin? Yes. Okay, excellent. And I'm going yeah, can... to share my screen. Um, all right. Yep. There it is. Okay, so um, I'm going to walk through this very, very quickly. Uh, because I think it's more important for the board to hear from you than for you to hear from me. Um, so we're going to see if we can't go through these slides really fast. Um, and that means they have to actually work for me. Uh, so uh, here's what we're doing to respond to the crisis. We've set up a lot of codes. Uh, Mary mentioned that, that we formed a fiscal response team um, that's her staff, 
staff from the uh, emergency management, public health, and my staff uh, were working together to ensure that we're tracking everything, documenting everything, and uh, going after all of the state and federal money that we can. So that's something we're working together on. Cost through April, um, we've spent about a million dollars that we would not have otherwise spent. Uh, the general fund, that's about 124000 to date, mainly in payroll costs. Um, 458000 uh, is the payroll from March 15th to the 31st. That includes the paid administrative leave of um, the 145000 and we um, don't have state or federal funds that cover that entire amount yet. Uh, we are looking constantly for other funding sources. Here's just a few slides on the uh, economic predictions. Economists are now talking about what is the shape of the downturn. So the V, um, that's where it would bounce back right away. Um, they're saying that is not likely at this point. Um, and L, I've never heard them talking about a L shaped recession before, but that's where it drops and it just stays down and doesn't come back. Um, they say that that's not probable. It will more likely be a U shape than an L shape, but they are talking about an L shape. Uh, what they say is the most likely at this point is they're going to see the uh, economy bounce back when we reopen but it's going to drop again as the effects of uh, unemployment, business failure, and a loss of tourism sets in. This was uh, on the webinar, I think, yesterday from Moody's, um, but it does seem to be the general uh, conversation. We know that our revenue sources in the county will be impact. So far, uh, the effect with, you know, emergency management and public health aside, most of the offices and departments in the county have been able to um, pay for these costs within your budget uh, because we already planned on paying for people's salaries. Appropriation is not necessarily the issue for most of you. Uh, what the problem is going to be is the revenue. So we're taking a hard look at what the revenue impact is going to look like. We're looking at um, all of our major funds and the major revenue streams, uh, looking at past patterns and trying to see if there's anything we can go on. And um, Moody's, I don't know how to get rid of these pictures so you actually see this slide, um, but Moody's and has they, a... They see it. They see it. This is just our control. I can move this. You can move that. I see the slide just fine. Oh, I can excellent. see it. I can see okay. it. Just me. Oh, perfect. Um, so what we've been told, um, and this came from a GFOA, is we've got to get used to uncertainty because it's going to be a while before we have data. So we need to accept that certainty is inevitable, um, assess uncertainty um, using ranges and references that we know, and then we need to augment our expectations or make it bigger because what we saw before is not necessarily what we're going to see now. Um, so what you see here is the first range we work on, and we're thinking that sales tax revenue shortfall is going to be anywhere from $1 to $4 million. Um, this is a first look based on uh, where we know we lost in the Great Recession 9% uh, in the first year. Um, so we're starting to think about if we have to cover a shortfall, how much is that revenue shortfall going to be? Um, we're doing these for all of our major funding streams. Here's four more. Uh, and Denise and Olivia are working on this for all of them. And again, I know I'm going really fast, but I want time for you to have a conversation with the board. Here's what sales taxes look like. Um, this is the what we think is going to be the hardest impact in the general fund is sales tax. It's about 12% of our revenue. Uh, property tax is pretty 
um, stable uh, because of the way we set the levy, but sales tax is the thing that we don't know. And it's going to be a while before we know. Um, we should have seen sales tax revenue for March and April in May and June, but because of the delay that the state has allowed, we're not going to see the amounts that come to the county until July and August. That is going to feel like a really long time. Um, property tax revenues, um, thank you, Jeff, for making that delay. Uh, we don't think we're going to see the real impact from the first half delay. It's going to be October before we start to see if people really can't pay their property tax. And then the uh, forecast from the Washington State Economic and Revenue Forecast Council that we rely on, it should have come out. Their forecast update normally comes out mid-month. They have delayed that. They're having a, a meeting with the council on Monday. We're going to listen in on that, and the update won't be passed until April 30th. Um, so we continue to wait, and we're constantly um, listening to economists and the experts that we know of around the country. Here's the things we need from you. Ensure that your staff are properly coding and paying all the expenses to the codes that have been set up. If you have grant opportunities, please send them to Joe Wolf in financial services. Uh, we've set up a brown bag for fiscal staff next Wednesday. Please ask your finance people to participate and make sure your financial plans are coming in on time this month um, so that we can factor what you're currently spending into the forecast. And then we really need you to start thinking about ways to save money. Um, I sent you, and I'm sorry I sent them so late, but I did send you a handout um, of ways to contain the budget. And then I also sent you a report called Cash is King um, from GFOA that has recommendations on ways we can save in the short term that are easily reversible in the long term. So I'm going to stop talking um, because you have very little time left to talk to the board. Okay, are you going to move your... Uh, yep. Okay. Hands raised. Anybody have uh, questions, input? All right. Go ahead, Jeff. So, uh, first of all, to add on to my report from earlier, I wanted to say I am coming into the office most days just to support the staff that I'm requiring to come in. So, uh, but in regards to this, uh, thank you for the very comprehensive list. Thank you for the uh, uh, handout from GFOA. I think this is going to help. We do have some difficult discussions to have. I am afraid second half property taxes are going to be a problem for a lot of people because up to this point, they have not felt the full economic impact of this. Uh, having said that, I do not anticipate being able to extend the property tax deadline at that time because of the principal and interest payments that are due on bonds December 1st. So um, I'm thinking about it, but I'm watching things very carefully. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else? Anything more to add, Robin? Um, so I'd like to suggest, since, since this is the first time that the elected officials are taking a look at these documents, and you've only got like five minutes left of this meeting, that we set up another time when they've got a little time to digest this and um, when we can set up an actual conversation about what path might make the most sense for us. And they have these slides now? They, I'll send them the slides. I already sent these two documents. Okay, got them. Thank you. Sound good, folks, on uh, on TV? Okay, good. Yes, thank you. Thank yeah, you very much. Um, most likely, it, I, it will be a lunch comment. meeting. Go ahead, Stephen. Um, I just wanted to uh, re-express an idea. Um, it's not doesn't appear on the list as such. Um, uh, however, uh, there has been a uh, technology fund 
that is receiving uh, contributions each year aimed at updating Ascend and Sigma. So this is a mutual software for the assessor and treasurer and then uh, the appraisal software that we utilized in my office. If um, we can get reasonable assurance, since it's all one vendor now due to acquisitions, that those uh, systems will be supported long enough, the legacy systems, uh, we could delay significantly the replacement plan and we could uh, reappropriate that money, which uh, I know there are a lot of projects in that pie, and I haven't seen the accounting of it, but I know that over a million dollars has been set aside for just these two pieces of software. And I believe that uh, I have a better chance of assessing property correctly and timely with old software than I do with fewer employees. Now, I still have six fewer employees than in 2008. We haven't filled the vacancies which occurred at that time. So taking a budget cut that takes employees is uh, uh, the equivalent of not getting the job done. And so, so I'm interested in having a dialogue uh, to understand the viability of that as a uh, general fund helper so that I know the value and can work with Jeff to reach out to the vendor to fully understand if it's a logical uh, thing for us to do. But, you know, we, we have a, we have a, a short-term um, serious financial problem and an unknown longer-term lesser problem. And that's a pretty good spike for one-time money. So uh, I would appreciate some dialogue on that and some real numbers on that because it gives me something to work on here, take a little bit of time to work over the contract. So we'll do that next time. Uh, Gary? Edwards? I, I, I guess I'd just uh, take a minute to say space is a premium. And now that we're... Uh, many of us are working from home, and we're in a situation now where we may need to continue social distancing for quite some time in the future, even if we try to go back to some normalcy. So I almost think it might be worth looking at those two issues. Uh, how can we be effective working from home for some of your staff? And because the space is so limited, uh, how are we going to provide social distancing? So maybe we can combine those two things and come up with a plan. That's uh, just a dilemma that we're probably in. Okay. Uh, and you have nothing? Any wrap up? No. Good. We're out of time now. Oh yeah, I'll, I'll try to schedule another lunch meeting similar to this one in two weeks for April 29th. Sounds great. Okay. Thanks, Thank everybody. You. Thank you very much for checking in. I appreciate it. Jeff, if you want, there's a lunch here for you. Come upstairs and get it. <laughs> All right. All right. Thank you. Wear masks, everybody. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much right. for joining us right. right now. We're done. Thank you. And those of you watching at home, if there is anybody, thank you for watching, checking in. Goodbye.